In previous units, we talked about how Boolean functions can be realized using logic gates. And uh, in this unit, we're going to talk about how we can actually build and implement the logic gates using a formalism called hardware description language or HDL. Once you build a logic gate in HDL, you can actually simulate it, test it, and finally build it in hardware as we now turn to describe. All right, so let's begin this uh, journey from abstraction to implementation. The first thing that you have to do as uh, a gate uh, architect is demand a full and complete description of the desired gate's uh, behavior. And in this case, what we need is some sort of a truth table. In the case of XOR, it's a very simple truth table. And the truth table, along with the gate diagram, gives you everything that you need in order to understand what this chip is supposed to do. And what we see here is also sometimes called the chip's interface. And indeed, using this information, you can start writing an HDL file that will look something like uh, uh, this example here. So we start the HDL program or the HDL file um, with some documentation, free form. You know, you can write whatever you want there, which describes what the gate is supposed to do. And then we specify the name of the chip, the names of the inputs of the chips, and the names of the chip's output. And all this information, by the way, the name of the uh, chip and the names of its, its inputs and outputs is typically given to you. You know, it's not something that you decide. It's something which is part of the chip's uh, contract, if you will. So you simply write it up uh, using the syntax, and then you write the magic word parts, which describes uh, that here begins the segment of your program in which you're going to describe how this chip is actually uh, designed. Now, when you use such a chip, such a XOR chip, what we've seen so far is called the gate interface. And notice that this is everything that I need in order to use a XOR uh, gate. However, if I have to build this gate, well, that's a different story. Now I have to open up the black box and actually design it. So when we use chips, we always wear two different hats. There's the hat of uh, the programmer who uses the chip as a chip part. And for this, all we need to know is the chip interface. And there is the other hat of the chips builder, which is what we're going to do uh, now. So moving along, let's uh, uh, discuss how we actually uh, build this chip from scratch. All right, so actually, we are not going to build it from scratch. We can, if we, if, we need, uh, if we need to, we can build it from uh, NAND gates only. However, let us assume that we, we've already built um, uh, an AND gate, an OR gate, and a NOT gate. Well, if we built these gates, or if someone gave us uh, uh, these gates uh, uh, that we can uh, freely use, uh, here is what we can do. We can inspect the truth table and figure out from the truth table that the XOR functionality can be described as follows. I mean, look at the XOR, look at the uh, uh, truth table. The gate outputs one in two cases only, if, uh, um, if A and not B, or if B and not A. That is, if A is true and B is false, or if B is uh, true and, uh, and A is false. This sort of comes out, jumps out from the truth table. You can either see it on your own, or as Noam described in one of the previous units, you can synthesize this, uh, um, uh, this insight uh, or this uh, Boolean function uh, from the table itself. So once you come up with this um, uh, insight, the next thing that you do is you think about it for a little while, and you come up with a gate logic diagram that describes how we can build this uh, uh, Boolean function using uh, basic uh, logic gates that we already have to our disposal. Now, developing such diagrams is a matter of experience. And the only way to, to gain this uh, expertise is to see many, many examples like, like this one. 
So let's take this example and, um, and explain it in, uh, in detail. So the first thing that we can do is draw the boundary of the chip uh, diagram, you know, the, uh, or the gate diagram. So uh, we use this uh, dashed uh, outline for this purpose. And what remains outside the boundary is the user's view of this gate. In other words, the, the gate interface. All the user knows is that he, uh, he or she has a gate that has two inputs, A and B, an output called out, and altogether, uh, they, uh, somehow this chip, as if by magic, delivers the XOR functionality. So we draw this uh, uh, diagram and, uh, and uh, this uh, interface, and now we can delve more into the, uh, into the inner uh, uh, architecture. So uh, notice how the A signal is being uh, copied and sent simultaneously into two different destinations. One of them is the end gate and the other one is uh, a not gate. This is perfectly okay in uh, chip diagrams and we see that the B signal undergoes the same, uh, the same treatment. And in general, when you write HDL code, you are allowed to take any signal and uh, distribute as many copies as you want of this signal into as many destinations as you want. Um, this, uh, this wiring or uh, this uh, dispatching is done simultaneously. So uh, to use a formal language, uh, HDL has unlimited fan out. You can, you can fan out uh, any uh, given signal to as many destinations as you want. And we do it, uh, uh, we always do it when we write HDL code. All right, moving along, notice that we're using some off-the-shelf uh, gates, and, not, and, or. Now, whenever you use an off-the-shelf off gate, you are bound to use the names of the gates, input and output, as advertised, so to speak. In other words, when you take the get gate off the shelf, the gate comes along with what can be called the gate signature or the gates API. So we have no degrees of freedom here. We have to use uh, the official names of uh, uh, the, uh, the inputs and outputs of, of every one of our chip parts. Now the next thing that we do is uh, let's focus on the red uh, connections that we see here. These are the connections that we draw in order to connect the different uh, chip parts together. Now the rule is that Every one of these connections has to be named, and it's our responsibility to come up with uh, sensible names. So that's what we do. Uh, we can call this particular connection not A, which is a sensible uh, name, I think, a self-descriptive name. Um, we'll do the same thing with uh, not B. We can call this one A and not B. We can call this one not B, uh, not A and B. And, and that's it. We, we, we have named all the internal connections in our architecture, and we can actually now move on to describe this diagram in HDL. So now we can actually move on and uh, implement this diagram using HDL. So we return to the HDL stub file that we had before, and I use the term stub file to describe a partial HDL implementation, so to speak, that actually describes only the chip's interface. And typically it comes with uh, uh, the statement implementation missing or put your code here and so on and so forth. So this is the contract that we actually have to implement. And now, indeed, we are going to focus on the implementation section of this file. And basically, what we do is we begin to describe the gate diagram one chip part at a time. And for each one of the chip parts that we have, we write a single HDL statement that describes the chip along with all its uh, connections. So we have two, uh, we happen to have two uh, not uh, chip parts, so we describe them. Um, the first uh, not has uh, uh, in equals A, 
This is the input, you know, the, the in input of the chip receives the A signal and the out output of, uh, of the chip goes into not A. We do something similar with the, with the other uh, uh, not chip. Uh, then we describe the two uh, end chips and finally we describe um, the, um, uh, the O chip. Notice, by the way, that I use the words gate and chip interchangeably and that's perfectly okay. A gate for me is simply uh, a simple chip. All right, so uh, this HDL diagram is nothing more than a textual description of the gate diagram. Did I say HDL diagram? I, I meant the HDL file is a textual description of, of the gate diagram that we see um, at the top of the slide. Now, I'd like to, uh, to notice that, uh, once again, we have interface, we have implementation, and also note that the interface of the chip is unique. You know, there's only one way to describe this chip, and this is typically given to us by uh, whoever, you know, commissioned us to implement this chip. At the same time, the implementation is not unique, and the same interface can be implemented in typically in many, many different ways. Uh, for example, in the case of XOR, we can implement the XOR chip using uh, three logic gates only. So, um, and it doesn't really matter how exactly we do it. We can, you can think about it on your own if you want. But uh, in general, there may be different implementations and some of them will be uh, uh, less expensive. They will contain less chip parts, less connections, consume less energy, and so on and so forth. So the interface is unique and the implementation varies. Now, I'd like to use this opportunity to make some general observations about, about HDL. And uh, for ease of reference, I have placed in front of you what we saw earlier uh, in this unit, the, uh, the gate diagram on the right hand, hand side and its uh, uh, HDL description uh, on the left. So what, what can we say about, about HDL? First of all, we see that um, there are certain issues in HDL which are very similar to what we normally do in other programming languages. We have to worry about good documentation of our HDL program, just like we do when we write a program in Java or Python. We have to come up with good descriptive names, both uh, to the chips that we use and to the connections that we, uh, uh, that we create within uh, the architecture. So readability is terribly important. You know, we have to make sure that our HDL code is self-descriptive and readable. And in order to do it, we also use indentation you know, and, uh, and make the code uh, look uh, uh, real nice. So all these things are expected from you when you write your own HDL programs. In addition, there are certain things which are really unique to HDL. First of all, HDL is a functional or declarative language. There's no procedure going on. There's no program execution going on. It is nothing more than a static description of the gate diagram. At the same time, you know, we assume that at some point this uh, uh, descriptive code will go into some interpreter, you know, will go into, in our case, into a hardware simulator that, that can actually take this description and start to uh, uh, sort of uh, pipe values from the bottom all the way to the end. So we assume that there is some agent that will turn this uh, implementation into something that, that is actually working. But this procedural part is not part of the HDL code. You know, it's external to the HDL code. So because HDL is a functional uh, language, we can actually write those uh, HDL statements in any order that we wish. You know, it doesn't matter if you begin to describe uh, the NOT gate or the OR gate, it's completely up to you. But it is typically, uh, um, um, it's uh, customary to begin to describe uh, your diagram from left to right and this also makes the code more readable. Um, also note that each time we use an off-the-shelf uh, gate, 
we commit ourselves to using uh, the gate interface, that is, the names of the inputs and outputs that come along with the gate uh, documentation. Now, in the hack computer that we're going to build uh, in this course, we decided as a matter of convention to almost always use the letters A and B for uh, uh, a two input chip and out for a single output chip. And uh, therefore, we are going to have uh, uh, many chip connections that look like A equals A and out equals out. Now, at the beginning, you know, this uh, formalism, uh, these conventions will look a little bit strange. You know, what does it mean A equals A, out equals out? If you think about it a little bit, and if you go back to consult these diagrams, you will see that these connections make a lot of sense. And actually, they are very uh, 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 convenient from a programming perspective. You will realize that once you get your hands dirty and write some HDL code of your own. So I'd like to end with some, uh, uh, some comments about how the description languages in general. There are many of them out there. And yet the two most popular HDLs that uh, at least I know of are VHDL and Verilog. These are the languages which are used, I think, in 90% of uh, uh, hardware uh, uh, design uh, projects. But there are many other HDLs out there that can be used as well. Uh, our own HDL is very similar in its spirit to the uh, industrial strength HDLs that I mentioned earlier, VHDL and Verilog, and yet it is uh, uh, a very minimal and simple version of these HDLs, and for this reason, you can master it in something like one hour of uh, reading a tutorial and, uh, and beginning to write some HDL code uh, um, of your own. And most importantly, our HDL, along with our hardware simulator, gives you everything that you need in order to build the computer described in this course and actually any other computer that you may want to build uh, using the knowledge that you will gain uh, um, in the NAND to Tetris course. So uh, if you want to read more about uh, HDL, and, and you should, uh, take a look at uh, Appendix A in the textbook and also read uh, 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 the HDL survival guide in our uh, NAND to Tetris uh, website. Uh, both are, are actually available in, in the website. And uh, you may want to also uh, uh, take uh, the hardware simulator tutorial and, and learn how to actually read HDL descriptions and, and execute the underlying logic of these uh, uh, HDL using simulation. So this has been the unit in which we gave you a primer of uh, HDL. And in the next unit, we'll describe once again how you can take your HDL designs and uh, bring them to life within the context of the hardware simulator.